Fans are on their feet and screaming. Snap, spot, kick is away, he's got the distance. It is good, good, And the good. Giants are going to Tampa Bay. It's over for the three-peats. It's over. That's the greatest euphoria I've ever had in sports right there. Keep on telling me I can't, and you know I'm going to the Super Bowl. So uh. the Giants' longtime backup quarterback was now New York's most sought-after star, and broadcaster John Madden wanted the next post-game interview. Bill Parcells was was coming up past me. As soon as he got to the buses, the buses were taken off. So I told the guys that were with me, hey, I only do this interview if you hold the buses. And they said, don't worry about it. He's not going to leave. Nobody's going to leave. So I do the interview with Madden. I come up and I think there were four or five buses, all of them gone. Madden came up and, and said, what's wrong? And I, <laughs> I told him that uh, Bill took off. And uh, he just started laughing and said, I'll get you there. Well, I thought, how in the world are you gonna get me there? I have no idea even where the plane is. We got on his Madden cruiser and his driver made a couple calls, pulled to the, uh, the airport and we pulled this back gate and somehow the back gate opens up I can remember walking up uh, uh, onto the plane and Bill was sitting there right away in the first row. And I can remember the look in his face where he was as surprised as could be that I was there. And just the nod of approval that I'd found the way to get there was all I needed. I told him we were going to San Francisco, pack for two weeks because we're not coming home. And the plane ride from there to Tampa was the most memorable trip that I've ever been on. It was such a celebration, the players so happy and, you know, they had a couple of beers and relaxed and it was just great. One of the great plane rides in history, flying from San Francisco to Tampa, everyone going nuts the whole time. What to do? Where are you going? We're going to Tampa Bay! Ah! That might have been the best plane ride I've been on in a long time, because I tell you what, we were some, we having some fun on that plane, though. Hey! <laughs> Tampa Bell, baby! Guess who's behind oh, us? Oh, 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 my God. Oh, 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 my God. Happy New Year, guys. We're going to the show. What are you going to do down at Tampa Bay? Thank you very much. Do you know who that was, folks? Course, huh? wow. He has to talk to me in 10 damn weeks. <laughs> Here we have Tom Coughlin, soon to be coached for Boston College University. After he wins the Super Bowl. DC. After he wins the Super Bowl. Coach, a few words for the family, please. I tell everyone out there that I expect the entire Giant organization to help me recruit this week. And I'm sure that all those prospects will immediately come to Boston College. Now Norwood tries to kick his longest ever on grass. Back, back. In the air, it's got the distance, it is no good. Wide right. Giants win, Giants win. Giants have won. Super Bowl 25. Before Super Bowl 25 in Tampa, Tom Coughlin, the Giants receivers coach, had already accepted the head coaching position at Boston College and was mapping out his own plan for success. I started the process of trying to put a staff together. and We did some recruiting right after the, <laughs> I, I had Bavaro and I, had, I remember uh, Mark saying to me, coach, is this kid interested in Notre Dame as well? I said, no, 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 Mark, this guy's not interested in Notre Dame at all. You know, <laughs> Notre Dame was in on the kid, of course. And then and Lawrence Taylor did the same thing, grabbed the phone, talked to him, yeah, you've got to go to Boston College, you've got to be with this guy, you know, that kind of stuff. So it was, from that standpoint, it was a whole lot of fun. In three seasons at BC, he turned the program into a consistent winner, capped off with a 41-39 victory over number one ranked Notre Dame. In 2004, Coughlin and the Giants would reunite as he was named the 16th head coach in franchise history. My heart's racing because in the back of, way back there, you know, 100 years ago, this is where I always wanted to be. Hello guys. Good morning, brother. Nice to see you. During the 1990 season, Giants punter Sean Landetta and rock star John Bon Jovi developed a strong friendship that has lasted 30 years and counting. To me, I had met John. Uh, we were out in the city one night and um, asked him if he'd like to come to practice. And being the Giant fan, he is absolutely. And I asked Bill, I cleared it with him, and 
Uh, I'm glad to hear that he yelled at you, so, you know, he, you fit in with the rest of us. Yeah. You didn't escape that. <laughs> but, yeah, it's just one of those things that he came to practice, and me being a big fan of rock and roll music and his songs, we formed a friendship. And there we are. Oh, my God. Look at that. Look at your girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look. Pretty good photographer. It's so true. Look at that. Bon Jovi also had a passion for photography, and when Sean introduced him to Giants photographer Mike Malarkey, they came up with an idea that would make the 1990 season one he'd never forget. Being on the sideline is a privilege, and it's really rarefied air. This is at a period in time when practices weren't open to the public, sideline passes were verboten, and unfortunately for me, meeting Mike through Sean, uh, and Mike Malarkey said, come over here, hold this camera bag. It was really important to me not to stand out. It was, it was make sure that you could be as close to being one of the staff as possible. So you tuck your hair up, you pair, you know, the cheap pair of sunglasses and a t-shirt. You know, in that rare occasion, I had a sleeveless shirt on because I would go out of my way to make sure that something like that Superman tattoo didn't stand out. You'd keep your head down. You were there to be a crew member. You were there behind the cameras. You know, you were holding the camera back. You were looking like an assistant, not like the rock star trying to be on the sideline. And so because of that, the, the photographers did the same kind of thing. And, and that's how I was uh, able to, you know, make friendships. Because I, I wasn't looking, it wasn't about me, it was about the game. And here, yeah, right. got you all camouflaged up a little bit. Yeah, 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 on enemy territory. Enemy. I was fortunate enough to, to go to away games. I was fortunate enough to be in Frisco for the playoffs. And Phil was hurt and Haas was doing his job out there. So I got to spend all that quality time with Phil Sims. And it was amazing. And Otis Anderson and LT and Carl Banks and Sean. And the Giants were on a roll. You were at the NFC Championship game in San Francisco? Yes, I was. Matty Barr. Yep. Matty Barr. Remember that? Yep. That was awesome. And it all goes on his shoulders. Snap, spot, kick is away, it's got the distance. It is good, good, And the good. Giants are going to Tampa Bay. It's over for the three-peats. It's over. <laughs> and giant football in the Super Bowl. There was a true sense of great American spirit in, in the building. The feeling in the stadium was, was unlike anything else that I could certainly in my adult years remember or since because, you know, the, the nation had come together in such a way uh, with Kuwait. Holy grail right here. Yeah. Look at that. Right. Our guy John gets these cool t-shirts made up. It says, show no mercy. This is before Under Armour and Nike existed in the whole... Yeah, the original wear. Under Armour guy. I mean, can you imagine? We all wore these With under the our Jovi shoulder logo and the giant logo. Yeah, on the, yeah. Bon and they Jovi wore these right underneath here. their Super Bowl uniforms. Yeah. I don't know if you believe in things like that or whatever, but, you know, just a... It was a little spark, you know what I'm saying? That you, you said to yourself, wow, look what he did for us. They were all placed on, the, on their stools in the lockers. No, this is, this is awesome. Remember, because of the Gulf War, I thought I was going to see you during the game on the sideline, but you couldn't get down because of security. Someone came up and got me in the box during the game. They said they want you down on the field. And remember, I turn, and there you are before Norwood's going to kick. Oh, yeah. And you and I are like this, watching oh. that kick. Uh, on that moment when Sean's talking about us being on the sideline for the kick, I was holding one of those plastic satellite little dish things. Some guy yelled at me, he said, hold this. You just did what you were told. And then when the, the kick went wide, we literally ran out on the turf. the press. Well, they were still saying a prayer back in those days. Before the champagne came out, everybody took a knee. Mr. Young said, come on in that dressing room. Before they closed the door, before anybody got in, when they took a knee, I was there. You know, that was re crazy ridiculous for a singer from a rock band in New Jersey. I was telling them when I got the ring made for you, yeah. remember that? I sure do. You know, it is one of my absolute most prized possessions of anything I have.
you know, having met Sean, having been uh, introduced to the Giant organization, and uh, and then ultimately, you know, being able to share in something like that, it's, it's unbelievable. The Giants have shaped John Bon Jovi's life. It's all deep blue. Everything I do is deep blue. In 1990, despite playing through an injury-riddled season with a broken wrist, Carl Banks would help lead the Giants back to the NFL mountaintop. When I found out that I had to have surgery on my wrist, the first thing I asked the doctor was, what's the rehab? How long? He says, well, if you were a construction worker, you'd be out 18 months. I don't have 18 months. But I knew, I said, I want to get back and play. And I'm aggressive as can be, and I set milestones for myself. And by the end of the season, I was back. I had a cast on it that would protect it from any further damage, but I knew I wanted to be there for the team. Following the Giants' win against the 49ers, two former Dallas Cowboys, who had never gotten a taste of a championship success, had their own plans upon arrival in Florida. Steve Diossi, just the most adventurous dude you ever want to meet. I got on the phone in the locker room in San Francisco and I rented a car at the airport in Tampa. We were going to enjoy this as much as possible, this Super Bowl experience. So when we got there, everybody was getting on the buses, going to, uh, uh, to the hotel. Cubby and I uh, went and picked up the rental car. This is what, 5 a.m. maybe? And uh, I just remember us going to the state. There was no one out there. I think a security guard. He let us in. We told him who we were. And I remember us going up, up into the stadium. And we drove around the stadium a little bit. We did like eight laps around the parking lots in the stadium. And uh, we were just there, man, you know, enjoying our success and really feeling blessed about us being there and having that opportunity. And I was like, man, we have come a long way. But the backdrop to Super Bowl 25 wasn't all fun and games, as it was clear that the nation's thoughts were with their soldiers overseas. The air base here in eastern Saudi Arabia is again under attack. The biggest sporting event on the American calendar it takes a backseat to the crisis unfolding in the Gulf. The concerns of all Americans are not just on the football game. No, our hearts remain with our fighting men and women in the Persian Gulf, and extreme precautions have been taken here today to see that this contest is not disrupted and that the folks gathered at Tampa Stadium are safe. Early this morning, hundreds of law enforcement officials poured into Tampa Stadium. They checked underneath the hoods of cars and inside the trunks. Meanwhile, FBI agents inside a U.S. Customs helicopter studied the stadium. What I remember, particularly being there during the Gulf War and uh, the ride to the stadium because we were going against traffic. It was just gridlock and just a sea of red, white, and blue. You know, we had the Bills, we had the Giants, same color schemes, patriotic thing going on. It was a surreal experience. And giant football in the Super Bowl. The crowd on its feet, tens of thousands of small American flags being raised. There were a lot of flags in the stadium that day, and that was in support of our, of our servicemen and women across the world. When you stood in the press box and you saw the armed soldiers right outside the press box, a helicopter gun ship was hovering, you know, there over the stadium. And uh, you began to, to really uh, wonder about, you know what, gee, should I, should I really have my entire family here? However, it was the Super Bowl. All the precautions have been taken, and the build-up to the game was sensational. It was a very emotional moment, especially when those F-16s flew over. You know, you just felt proud to be an American and playing in the 25th anniversary of uh, the Super Bowl, it was awesome. That was really satisfying to win with that. After losing your quarterback, everybody said you can't win without your starting quarterback. Well, Jeff Austin proved that wrong. Well. That victory in the Super Bowl was the culmination of a lot of hard work. And I think that was the embodiment of what Giants football was about. In 2015, the 1990 Giants team would reunite for their 25th anniversary and show that their bond is stronger than ever. It's hard for me to believe uh, that it's been 25 years uh, since that miraculous season, but 
I tell you, this was such a special group of guys, a special group of players. Well, it seems like a long time ago, but you know what? You get back here and you see the guys, and uh, you start seeing some video of it. And you know, maybe it wasn't quite that long ago, but uh, a lot of stuff still fresh in your mind, and that to me is pretty amazing. Hey, buddy. How are you doing? Great to see you. You look great. Thank you. This is is really a special, special, special group, and a tremendous leader in Coach Parcells who encouraged us all to take care of one another. I think of all the teams I ever had, without question, this was the most resilient, mentally. You know, you have your personal life and your professional life, and then you've got your memorable events, and this is one of those. Will! Hey, Coach! <laughs> Big dog! How you doing, man? <laughs> I see some of these guys I haven't seen them in a long time and what we accomplished 25 years ago uh, it's fantastic it's always good to, to come back to New Jersey New York and, and be a part of this organization we are always been close and uh, I think we'll remain close because uh, we have no choice because we're champions and, you know, and Bill said a long time ago nobody can ever take it away from you so we put the anniversary patch on one sleeve and the Super Bowl patch on the other. And this is in honor of Stephen Baker, who never got a jacket, and I, <laughs> I, hold, I hold it to him forever. So finally, Stephen, you get your jacket. Today, the Giants have a very special presentation as we honor and pay tribute to one of the greatest teams in Big Blue history. Number 89, Mark Bavaro. The Super Bowl MVP, Otis Anderson. And Hall of Famer, number 56, Lawrence Taylor. In Super Bowl 25, they didn't give us a chance. A backup quarterback, an old running back, but we had you guys. We're glad to get back together share it with each other, celebrate it with you, and we thank all you Giant fans for your undying support for all the years. Thanks a lot. Go Giants!